the topic is about education, particularly music education, and it's to deal with a circumstance that we find ourselves in Australia at the moment where I believe education is in a pretty shoddy state. I think we have serious problems in this country with education, and I believe there are reasons for those problems, and I think that the problems can be fixed. But I want to make a general statement about education based on the work of the philosopher, novelist, and great intellectual Iris Murdoch. Iris Murdoch said this, education does not make you happy, nor does freedom. We don't become happy just because we are free, if we are, or because we are educated, if we have been. But education may be the means by which we know we are happy, and leads us to the understanding that there is only one freedom worth having, and that is the freedom of the mind. That's a little paraphrase of Iris Murdoch's view, but it's a wonderful view, and she nails it in my view from the point of when she starts talking about the freedom of the mind. Because the most important thing we have is our minds, together obviously with our health. But when children go to school, we allow their minds to be put in the care of others. And we hope that others will develop their minds. So why do we go to school? What's the point? I believe we go to school for two reasons, and two reasons only. That is, the reasons are to learn how to learn, and to learn how to think. Currently, in Australian education, we have a very, I believe, debased system of assessing children and it's called standardised testing. I believe standardised testing is iniquitous. It is one way of measuring children, but it doesn't tell you anything about a child that the teacher doesn't already know. It is not diagnostic. It appeals to the lowest common denominator. It makes life very easy for a lazy teacher and it frustrates the creative teacher. The lazy teachers love NAPLAN because it's all worked out for them. They just have to teach to the test. The creative teacher is frustrated because he or she knows that at some stage in years 3, 5, 7 or 9, the child will undergo this iniquitous thing called NAPLAN. Why are grade 3 children being tested at all? And for that matter, why grade 5, 7 and 9? What does the test reveal? As I said, it reveals nothing that teachers don't already know. It also turns education into a competition because the results are made public and they're on a site called My School. And you can go and find out what your ranking is. And what the results do is this. The results serve as a form of advertising for private schools because the private selective schools get the best results, so their waiting list enrolments go up. That has nothing to do with education. Education is not a competition. Education should be about exploration of the mind, exploration of ideas, exploration of thought, leading children to have that quality we refer to as wisdom, the capacity to make choices, the capacity to make decisions, the capacity to think about the directions they might travel or the directions they might take in their lives, not about filling in boxes on objective tests. 
That is not education. And until we address that circumstance in this country, we will continue to plummet in the PISA scores. If you were in touch with the newspaper recently about the most recent NAPLAN results, you will know that between 2008 and 2015, there has been no change in the status of education in this country. No change. The only state which lifted its game a little bit was the WA, which simply means it was lower than everybody else. The same mediocrity has been preserved for a considerable amount of time. This is a very serious problem in this country. Furthermore, we can identify within the country three really serious problems, as I just said, associated with education. One is we don't pay teachers properly. We do not reward teachers financially the way we should. The second thing is we do not trust teachers. We do not allow teachers to be truly autonomous. And the third thing is, at the risk of repeating myself, standardised testing. The first two, paying teachers properly and trusting teachers, allowing teachers to be autonomous, is vital. Because it's the teacher, in the end, who is going to be responsible. We want the teachers to be responsible about what they teach and how they teach. How they deliver the information and how they encourage children to use that information thoughtfully. We have lost in education the individual integrity of arts subjects. We now call them the arts. It used to be music, dance, drama and visual arts, but it's now called the arts. There was a move in the 60s to amalgamate these subjects and call them creative or performing arts, as if a creator couldn't be a performer and vice versa, as if a performer couldn't be a creator and that there was a distinction. They were decisions made by bureaucrats and curriculum writers, many of whom have no experience in the arts and no experience in teaching. They're the people making the decisions often about curriculum. When we made that decision to go to the things called the arts, the integrity of each subject was immediately put at risk because what happened was curriculum writers were encouraged to find a common language that all the arts could use so that teachers and children wouldn't be confused. So in other words, musicians were asked not to use the word compose and to drop the term composition, but to actually call it make. They were makers. So the visual artists were makers. This was absolutely spectacular nonsense. <laughs> and I fought it at every level and at every syllabus meeting I attended. It was disgusting that we were put into that circumstance and the teachers were trying to find parallels between music, dance and drama and visual arts and teach them all as one thing. The national curriculum has at least addressed the idea that the arts have some sort of independence, although they are referred to, if you go to the Akara page on the website, they are still referred to as the arts, which is most unfortunate. If we can finally get to the stage where we will actually call them music, dance, drama and visual arts, that would be good. But we've introduced another arts area called media arts. I'm not sure whether you're aware of media arts, but it exists and it is a subject in the national curriculum, but I don't wish to discuss it in any detail. <laughs> Within the arts, I believe there is a hierarchy. I believe there is a way in which we introduce children to the arts, to music, to dance, to drama, and to visual arts. And why do we do it? Why is it important that children should have music education? 
or education in dance, education in visual arts. Why is that important? I think it's important for a number of reasons. I'm going to start not necessarily with the reasons intrinsically associated with music, but those reasons which are generated by virtue of the fact that music, for example, to be comprehended requires intense listening. When does listening begin? We know that listening begins in the womb. At the 18th week, babies can hear. And there's very good evidence that just before babies are born, they can discriminate. Highs and lows, softs and lows, and they react physically. So this listening component is clearly very powerful. The fact that in order to survive, a baby really needs to be able to hear its parents' voice, the inflection of the parents' voice, and sounds around it, has a potent effect on the way it will ultimately listen. So when a parent sings to a child, or rocks a child and hums, for example, or sings nursery rhymes. This is the beginning of developing listening. And this is where children develop their listening skills. So children who don't have songs sung to them, who aren't held and cradled and rocked and danced with and moved with, are at a distinct disadvantage. Because the most potent time is that period from postnatal to about eight. It's not to say that beyond that you can't learn music or that you can't learn to listen, but that's a valuable time in a child's life. And as this listening goes on, as the child begins to accrue knowledge, it accrues that knowledge orally and by rote. So in other words, it hears the songs and the games and the rhymes, it remembers the songs and the games and the rhymes, and it repeats them, and it repeats them over and over. And a young child can build an extraordinary vocabulary of songs and rhymes and games to play, all memorised. And not only memorised, but can implicate to you differences when you sing the rhyme a different way or you sing the wrong word. The child will correct you because they learn it very quickly. Along with this, they're learning language. So when they're learning a nursery rhyme, two things happen. They learn the rhythm of the rhyme and they learn the rhyme itself. Today, in our workshop with the teachers, I always explain to them that young children tend to learn nursery rhymes backwards by virtue of the rhyme. So they will know the rhyming word at the end of the line before they know the complete line. So they'll tend to say, Humpty Dumpty Sarana, war. Humpty Dumpty Sarana, four. And they'll get great satisfaction out of saying the rhyming word. This is pattern recognition. And this is recognition of order. And this concept of pattern and order is vital to understanding because what it does is it gives the child an awareness of how pattern works and in music pattern is vital did you hear these pieces today Copeland, the Rachmaninoff and the Bach Invention all filled with pattern that even the most abstruse contemporary music will contain pattern. And this concept of pattern is learned very, very early. And it stays with us all our lives. We never lose it. It stays in the memory and in the brain all our lives. And there is very, very strong evidence in patients who suffer from mental illness or dementia that the music is what triggers memory and how they remember music. I'm not a neuroscientist and I'm not going to talk about neurology, but the evidence is really, really powerful. And the neurologists are doing extraordinary work on the power of music on the brain. That's not my area. I can read the research, but I'm not qualified to talk about it. 
As we go through music with children and we have this concept of rhyme and song and game and dance, children become makers of music. And they start to make their own music and their own songs and their own games and their own rhymes around the age of three. End of two towards three, coming into, say, the age of four. They become makers. They start to use words and they enjoy making patterns with words. And they love the repetition. And I'll give you an example. My own, four, recently turned four-year-old uh, granddaughter, and she was singing a song recently called Sleep Baby Sleep. It was going, Baby, 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 sleep, 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 baby, 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 sleep, sleep, baby, baby, sleep. And I was accompanying her on the piano, I'm trying to find where the pitch was, <laughs> which was fine. And then she said, baby, sleep, baby, sleep, baby, 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 baby. And I stopped and she went, what do you think is I'm saying? There's more to come. Baby, sleep, baby. And on she went, and then I finished, and then she bowed. <laughs> Now, she does that often. We often have our song sessions, spontaneous singing, and she comes up with weird, wonderful things. My life, my life, my life. <laughs> and I think, I, I'm not quite sure I want to go that far. But okay. <laughs> That's what we do. So, but we know that universally the children are song makers. And there is a person in this country, Margaret Barrett, Professor Margaret Barrett, who is the head of Music at the Queensland Conservatorium, is researching this children as song makers. And it's a really, really interesting piece of research because it demonstrates that every child has this capacity to invent. Every child has this capacity to invent. And the first thing that we knock out of them at school is their capacity to invent and their capacity to think independently because they have to be tested. So, this creativity is inherent. We know children have this capacity but we have to find how it happens. Now, why music? We know about the listening. That listening has a potent effect on all learning. And the evidence is this. Children who study music at a depth, who learn an instrument maybe, but who certainly who sing and who read music, and can read from sight, pitch, and rhythm as they learn their music, have an advantage in all areas of learning. I want to stress that is not a reason for teaching music. It's a bonus. You have to distinguish between the reason and the bonus, but it's a bonus that's worth having. And it's such a great bonus that you would say were a child not receiving music education, the child is not being educated. Music is fundamental to human beings. Human beings sang before they spoke. They think roughly 250,000 years of singing before speaking. Music is in our DNA. And this listening skill that works along with music translates to everything. So why wouldn't you have it just for that reason? Never mind the real reasons for teaching music. So, what are the real reasons for teaching music? I believe as follows. One, we teach music because it's good. And you don't need any other justification. It's good. We teach music because it's unique. We teach music because we want children to make their own music. We teach music because it acts on the heart, the mind, the soul, and the spirit and the imagination of a child in unique ways. These reasons are really powerful. They are not necessarily reasons that governments understand or principals understand. Principals understand 
that if music is being taught in the school, there'll be a higher retention rate in the school, there'll be good concentration in other subjects, reading will improve, maths will improve, and then good things to happen. And we want principals to know that that's true and that they will support that. And that bonus side of it is a reasonable way, in my view, to go in. Because it is better to have that as the reason than not have the music. So, what music? What do we teach children? And what is music's nature that it's worth teaching? Music, I believe, is abstract. It has no inherent meaning and is non-descriptive. That makes it very special. It singles it out from drama, from visual arts and dance. The abstract nature of music is its most potent force. Because when you hear music, we don't really know how you hear it. We have no idea what goes on with imagination. We know neurologically what happens, but we don't know what happens with your imagination. And we do know that music, because of its abstract nature and the fact that it's non-descriptive, can evoke, suggest, imply all sorts of things in the mind of a child. What about program music? For example, Liszt and Strauss wrote pieces called Don Quixote and Helden Leben and Mazeppa and all sorts of things, which had extra musical ideas. It came from poetic ideas, things outside of music, not absolute music. Fine. So let's talk about death and transfiguration, Strauss. What sort of death? What sort of transfiguration? Do we all think the same thing when we hear the opening notes of death and transfiguration? Do we all imagine the same man in the same room with the same pyjamas? I don't think so. In spite of what Strauss thought. And Strauss thought he could describe anything, and we love him for that. But he was wrong. Simply because if it could describe, and if it could describe accurately, we would all receive exactly the same message. But we don't. And that's its great joy. This abstract nature is potent. And the fact that it's intangible. You can't see it, you can't feel it in the sense of a real touch, but you can feel it go through your body. And you can't describe it other than its own, in its own terms. Here is the C sharp, that's a B flat major chord, and that's loud. Beyond that, we can't really talk about it. That's potent, because it allows children to go into a really special abstract world. And this concept of the abstract is powerful in all learning. The children have a capacity to understand what abstraction means. And we have two fantastic examples this afternoon. The Eric Abner piece is called The Cat and the Mouse. Which one is the cat and which one is the mouse? You don't have to answer that question. And when you were listening to that, did you imagine a cat and a mouse? If so, what colour was the cat and what colour was the mouse? Who won? Did the cat eat the mouse? Or did the, ma did the, ma the ma mouse win? In the Rachmaninoff, what do we imagine in the Rachmaninoff? It simply says, C sharp minor, O G. And we can think of all sorts of things when we hear that music. When we hear the Bach on the percussion instruments, that's really the one of the, the climaxes of absolute music. So we hear two independent lines copying each other. So this rare thing about music, its abstraction and its intangibility, makes it really potent. Now people will say, art can be abstract. What about abstract painting? What about it? You can see it. If there's an abstract painting on the wall, white on white, you can see that it's white on white. It's not abstract in and of itself, but the subject might be. But in and of itself, it's not abstract. Theatre of the absurd, 
Mind, similarly, is not abstract. Dance is not abstract, although it may represent some things which are. That's where music is unique. And where music allows you into a world which is fundamentally subjective at every level. Every level is subjective. How you felt about it, how the piece should go, what did the piece say to you? Subjective. Those reasons are very, very powerful reasons for teaching music. Because when you introduce children to this concept of abstract, you provide them with a vehicle for interpretation of the imagination when they rework that material. So when you're teaching children to improvise, which we should all do, because we want them to make their own music, you give them this abstract material, which they then rework. And they take things they know, and they turn them around. And it starts with their two and three. They take little songs they know, and they play with them. And that's the beginning of composition. Because really, we want children, in the end, to make their own music. Because it is in the making of their own music that they understand how other music works. So if you're studying a Bach invention, and the composition students I teach, I do this invention. We do this invention. And the question I ask them is, how does the piece begin? And they say, it begins with a scale, la 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 la. I said, listen to the question. How does the piece begin? And they say, well, it begins with a C, and then it goes to D. And I say, listen to the question. How does the piece begin? Sometimes it takes 15 minutes to work out. It begins with a semi quaver rest. The piece goes, ba -la 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 -la. Ba -la -la. it has a semi quaver rest. And that semi quaver rest drives every pattern in the invention. That's a really important piece of musical information. And I never tell them. They have to work it out. And then they realise, if they come to me for a composition lesson, it's going to be tough. <laughs> and at the end of every lesson I say to them, do you want another lesson? <laughs> and they can say no. And so can I. <laughs> That's the agreement we have. It's not to be taken for granted. So this wonderful collection of qualities that music has, and the way in which it impacts on our spiritual and our mental being, our social being, and the fact that it can give children extraordinary joy and happiness, they're all good things for children to have. And when a child says, I love this piece of music. A year nine boy recently said to me about a Schubert trio. This is the most beautiful piece of music I have ever heard. Year nine boy, Schubert trio. Having been told the children will not like this program. The children sat there and adored the program. And one boy said it was the most beautiful thing he'd ever heard. Please don't tell me what children will and won't like. It's the way you treat children and the way you present things to children. If you treat children as idiots, they will behave as idiots. If you give children rubbish music, they will treat the rubbish music as rubbish and they will behave as rubbish. Which leads me to the question, what do we teach children? There is a move to teach children only contemporary music, only popular music, because they like it. That is neither a reason nor is it is an acceptable educationally. It's indefensible educationally. Why would you teach children things they already know? Surely we go to school to find out about things we don't know. 
and to be introduced to a large world of the unknown. And one of the great things about education is exploration of the unknown. A constant diet of music they like is not a substantial diet. It can be part of it, but not all of it. So what we really want is children to have a wide repertoire of music. Songs, folk songs, world songs, popular songs, art songs, all sorts of songs all sorts of instrumental music, all sorts of music, so they can learn to develop taste, understand and make choices about what they like or don't like, because in the end that's what it's going to be. It's going to be about subjective things. And the best way to do that is to teach children to sing. All musical concepts can be learned through singing. And if we can do that, if we can get every child in this country seen, and we have every child in the hands of a competent teacher who really understood music, we would turn this country around. This country would turn around. Look at Finland. How do the Finns do it? Why are the Finnish children any brighter than ours? They don't go to school till they're seven. They have no standardised testing at all. I'll tell you why they do it. They believe that the teacher is the most important member of society. And they pay the teachers at the highest level. They pay them more than doctors and lawyers and engineers. And to get into teaching, you have to be spectacularly gifted at every level to get into teaching in Finland. There's a case recently where they have 2,000 applicants for one teaching university and they took 100. Because all the others are considered unsuitable for teaching. They're serious about teaching. They're serious about education. Are we in this country? No, we are not. Some people are to a small degree. But unless governments get serious about it, we'll never get serious about it. My job, the little I can do, is to convince governments that music education is worth having. But we need to vote for those people who will give us education properly, who will treat education seriously and believe that the most important investment we make is in the mind of a child. Thank you.